I would like to say Happy Sabbath and Happy New Year to everyone. And congratulations on making it through 2020. <laughs> now, I chuckle when I say that, but honestly, it is no small thing that you made it safely through one of the craziest years that have ever been seen in our history. It's probably not the worst year of all time, but it's certainly been a tough year for many, and maybe even the toughest year of many of our lives. And I want to publicly thank God for bringing us through it. Praise the Lord. 2020 is over and 2021 is here and congratulations are in order. So congrats, everybody. The Lord is good. <laughs> Last year, we had a theme that guided us through our preaching calendar and it was called Focus 2020. Each letter in the word focus stood for something, and we used that to guide us through our discussions, our sermons throughout the year. You remember, F is for family, so we started with a family series in 2020 where we spoke to husbands, wives, children, and parents, even singles. But we also added Pastor Job to our leadership team this year, and that was one of the biggest bright spots of 2020. She is our newest pastor for children and families, and she was able to accomplish some great things for our children and families of our church this year, including a virtual VBS, weekly children's church Zooms, and even an outdoor, socially distanced painting party for our children and the parents in our church center courtyard this summer. Pastor Job has been really a bright spot. She brightened up our entire leadership team here at Tacoma Park, and we're so happy to have her. O is for outreach, and we not only heard sermons on ways to stay connected to our community through outreach efforts and by also participating in several uh, outreach activities, but even during the pandemic, we did other things. Pastor Shisto organized and executed some food box drive throughs clothing and coat drives. Our members volunteered with the partners at uh, Adventist Community Services, and we gave financial support to the House of Divine Guidance this year, and they are the team who uh, helps with with people experiencing homelessness. We even had a huge win in 2020 as we teamed up with Action in Montgomery to get a commitment for a new school building to be built for the children of South Lake Elementary School here in Montgomery County. And I, for one, am very proud of our church family and the way that we remained engaged in outreach even during a pandemic. Once again, I say to God be the glory. <laughs> See. C is for collaboration, and boy, did we have to collaborate this year. You see, collaboration is all about working together to produce or create something, and in 2020, we were challenged in a different way to collaborate in creative and new ways than we ever anticipated that, we would, uh, that would even be necessary this year. To produce these broadcasts, in fact, from week to week, for instance, takes high levels of collaboration. Pastor Otley has been working hard to be sure that every part of our worship service is fine-tuned and ready to go from week to week. We're all collaborating with Mikhail Modest and the AV team at, at a much deeper levels than we did before and, and, and we're, uh, since our quarantine schedule began. And collaboration with even our finance team has been effective in 2020. We've even found new ways to connect with and to collaborate with other churches, like the Church of the Advent and other ministries in the surrounding area. We want to be as effective for God's kingdom as we can. And since we all feel limited by the pandemic, everyone is looking for new ways to work together to build up the kingdom of God. Collaboration was key in 2020. U is for unity. And if I'm being honest, I have never felt more unified in our church family than I do right now. I wonder if you feel the same way. There seems to be something that happens within the family of God, and we tend to band together more closely during times of hardship and difficulty. Have you noticed that? We have been needing comfort for all the lost and, and, and hopeful words for all the despair and encouraging deeds for all the hardship. And the great common denominator of all of these things has been the love of God that has never left us nor forgotten about us. For all of our differences, 
We are all unified under the banner of the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I feel unified in our pursuit of heaven more so now than ever before. And for all of that, I say to God be the glory. <laughs> and then S. S is for sanctuary renovation. And it may seem like nothing happened in that regard since our sanctuary looks the same now as it did before the pandemic started. But we have been making plans. We've been laying the groundwork financially and have been having discussions about things that we can do while the sanctuary is empty so that when we come back together again, we can be ready for and fully prepared for the worship of our Lord and Savior in a space that is befitting his matchless majesty and wonder. Who says amen to that today? <laughs> so coronavirus may have slowed us down a bit, but it did not stop us. And in some areas of engagement and connectivity, it actually helped us out a little bit. And, and to God be the glory, I need to say one more time for that. <laughs> We've grown with our virtual membership as well. We've seen several people who have asked to join our family officially from other parts of the country and around the world. We can see the evidence of God's hand working with the Tacoma Park SDA Church in 2020. And I, for one, am grateful and thankful to him for his faithfulness to us, even during the most terrible year of our lives. God has been good. But today, in the spirit of the new year, I would like us to focus our attention on a reset of sorts. In many ways, that's what a new year is for us, right? That's what it offers to us. It's a chance to start over. And many of us are looking for this as a time to recommit, reunite, revive, and maybe even resolve to be better than we were before. A new year brings promise and hope and a chance to do things better than the last time. And it seems like it wouldn't be too hard to be better in 2021 than it was in 2020, right? I mean, how could it get any worse? <laughs> Well, maybe it actually can. There is a phrase that I have said and that you may have said, and if we're not careful, could set us up to be in a dangerous position. And that phrase is this. I can't wait until things get back to normal. Now, on its face, those words by itself aren't actually dangerous words. That's not really a dangerous statement by itself. But if left unchecked, that desire for normalcy could take us to a place that was never meant for us as Christians here on this earth as we await the coming of our Lord. I want to talk about that very thing for a few minutes today in this message entitled, Stay Woke. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need your guidance today. We need you on this first Sabbath of the new year to speak to our hearts. If you are our teacher, we will listen, we will learn, and we will grow, but only by your spirit. Let us see Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, starting in the NIV. The Bible says, Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates we do not need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety... Destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, Encourage, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Who says amen to God's word today? Stay woke. That's a saying that we have heard often in 2020 as we journeyed together on a road to racial awareness in this country. 
When the historians look back on 2020, they very well may dub 2020 the year that America woke up to their real feelings about racism, racial injustice, and racial equality. The term woke is mainstream these days and can be found in the dictionary. Merriam-Webster defines woke this way, aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues, especially issues of racial and social justice. The call to stay woke in the black context has always been used as a reminder to stay on your toes about issues related to race, especially when circumstances seem like they might be improving. Don't get caught up in the hype. Don't be fooled by the token gestures of equality. Don't get sucked into the appearance of incremental improvement. Stay woke. Remain vigilant. Keep your eyes open. Don't let your guard down. That's what it means in the black community. The call to stay woke has a clear meaning in a world filled with racial injustice, but I'd like to submit that it's a borrowed idea. The Bible tells us to stay woke first, <laughs> but with an expanded field of view. And Paul is trying to broach this topic with his people in our passage. Paul is very concerned about the people of the church of Thessalonica. A persecution began while he was present and it continued during his absence. So Paul was a bit anxious about his Thessalonian converts. One scholar says he knew that because of the shortness of his stay with them, they were only partially instructed in the ways of Christianity. So he feared that they might fall from faith. Twice he tried to visit them, but circumstances had prevented him. So Paul sends his fellow laborer, Timothy, to ascertain their condition. And this letter, 1 Thessalonians, is what follows once Paul hears back from Timothy when he gives the report. And I'm intrigued by the way that Paul begins chapter 5. Notice in our passage, chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. That is the new King James. Now, this is an interesting way to put it because, because the, to this point, Paul has been very instructive and encouraging and informative and edifying in chapters 1 through 4. But now Paul says about this subject, I don't even need to write anything because it's so obvious. Paul's words are very clear. Jesus is coming soon. He's talking plainly to his readers about knowing the times and being ready for the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The signs were clear in Paul's day, and the signs are clear in our day as well. Who says amen to that today? Signs, 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 signs are an interesting thing. We visited my parents' home in Huntsville for Christmas this year, and we really had a great time with them. In fact, I want to thank you for allowing us to go away and to get some R&R. &R. We kind of have our trips down to a science now. It takes about ten and a half hours to get from Laurel to Huntsville, and since I'm a morning person, I always take the first shift, and as long as we leave around 4 a.m., it's usually a good trip. I like the fact that by the time the sun comes up, we've already spent several hours on the road. Somehow for me, the trip doesn't begin until the sun comes up. <laughs> it almost feels like uh, we got like a three hour head start on the trip once the sun finally gets up. You know what I'm saying? And even though we use the GPS to guide us on our trip, we would still be lost if there were no road signs. Road signs tell you that you're going in the right direction. They inform you of the way and confirm to you that you're headed to the correct spot. And when your GPS tells you to turn right in a thousand feet, you normally look at the street name on the phone to be certain that the street you're supposed to be turning on is the right one. Don't you do that? This is especially helpful when there are two streets that are unusually close to one another. You normally can't tell. You don't really know that the street you're supposed to turn down is the right one unless you look at the signs, even if you're using a GPS. Road and street signs are indispensable on a road trip. Well, the same is true for our Christian journey. 
God has placed road signs in his word to clue us in that we're headed in the right direction. And we are on a trip to heaven. And the signs that I'm seeing are telling me that we're almost there. And Paul is saying to his readers that the signs for the coming of the Lord are so obvious that he doesn't even need to talk about them. Paul's being hyperbolic. He's, he's deliberately exaggerating. He's overstating for dramatic effect. He, he's really just saying that the signs are so clear for a Christian that he might as well save his breath. <laughs> There's no reason to even talk about it. Don't you feel that way? It's amazing. The interesting thing is that after what we came through in 2020, we can all probably agree with Paul. In fact, it feels like Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians 5 in 2020, doesn't it? <laughs> so if it's that obvious, why am I preaching about it today? If it's so clear, how come we've been talking about it? Well, it turns out what Paul says next is of the utmost importance to us. And we may not need to revisit the significance of the signs, but we must discuss the idea of staying woke. Paul doesn't want his readers to let their guard down. And things are setting up for that to happen to us, potentially, this year. So let me show you three reasons why it's important that we stay woke in 2020. The first is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3. And you know I like to do this. We read opening in the NIV. I want to read this in the NLT, just to give us a little different perspective. Here's what the Bible says. Now, concerning how and when it will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we do not need to write you. We said that already. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. The first thing we learn is that we must fight to stay woke because we crave comfort and ease. Repeat after me. Normal is code for comfortable. <laughs> Notice what happens in the way Paul sets up his argument here. He starts by stating the obvious. Jesus is coming soon. We can all see the signs. Then he says, we know his coming will be like a surprise, will be a surprise like a thief in the night. But then he reveals something about our human nature that we should not downplay. He says, it's exactly when everyone is feeling peaceful and secure that disaster will fall on them. What disaster is he referring to exactly? He must be talking about being lost when Jesus comes the second time. Remember now, there are only two groups of people in the end. There are those who will be saved and those who will be lost. Put another way, you are either going to heaven with Jesus and all the angels when he returns, or you're going to be destroyed along with the earth when Jesus burns it all up in the end. And Paul is saying that the differentiating factor between those who are saved and those who are destroyed may not actually be a lack of knowledge, but instead it could be a safe, peaceful, and complacent attitude of ease and normalcy. It's just when you're saying peace and safety that disaster will come. Lord have mercy. The second coming is not a disaster for the saved. It's only a disaster for the lost. Now, here's why this is so important, my friends. 2020 was an extreme year in every way. The pandemic was extreme. The loss of life was extreme. Our inability to congregate and commune was extreme, and so were our travel restrictions. Things were so crazy this year that we had to begin seeing things that are happening now as our new normal, because it lasted so long. And now the one thing we long for, the one thing we'd all love to see, the one thing that we'd all welcome back with open arms, is some normal. <laughs> all I want is normal. Have you said that lately? I just can't wait till things get normal again. Yeah, I've said it too. And I know what you mean when you say it. You probably mean the same thing that I mean. You want to be able to do regular stuff again, 
<laughs> you want to leave your house when you feel like leaving your house. You want to go to a concert again or to a basketball game. You want to be able to travel and, and eat at a restaurant and shake someone's hand or give them a hug without worrying that you're going to contract a deadly virus. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I want those things too. But there is a part of our human nature that Paul's trying to reveal to us here that we need to be careful about. Stay with me, please. The word normal is often code for comfortable. And we all like to be comfortable, don't we? It's really what our American culture is built on. It's built on comfort. We want to be comfortable in every way in our lives, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We strive for comfort in our careers, our lifestyle, our relationships. We want a comfortable riding car, enough space in our home to be comfortable. And you know we all like comfort food. I know I do. <laughs> comfort is part of who we are as Americans. And let me pause right here just to say that I'm not demonizing comfort in any way. I don't think it's a sin to be comfortable. But I do think our comfort is a gateway to slumber. In other words, if you're too comfortable, you can't stay woke. <laughs> Remember that car ride I was telling you about earlier to my parents' house? It was so wonderful. You know, the one where we get the three-hour head start because we start before the sun comes up. Well, I need you to know that it turns out the early start and the wonderful road signs that keep me up and make sure that I am on the right path are all good, but they actually mean nothing if I fall asleep while I'm driving, right? Now, I wish I didn't have any actual experience with this kind of thing, but I actually do. In fact, some of you know, in July of 2001, I fell asleep at the wheel on I-40 in Arkansas, and we almost lost our lives. There were four of us in the car at the time. The signs meant nothing that night because I couldn't stay awake. And part of the reason why I fell asleep is because I was too comfortable while I was driving. I don't tell this part of the story a lot. A few weeks before the trip, I purchased a massage pad for my driver's seat. It went on top of my seat, it plugged into the cigarette lighter, and it massaged my back and stuff while I was driving. It made my seat more comfortable for a long trip, but it made it too comfortable for a long trip. You know what I'm saying? When I needed was something that was going to be so uncomfortable that it would keep me awake. I needed to stay woke. Has it occurred to any of us that the trials of 2020 were bad, but at least they kept us awake and alert and in a state of anticipation and readiness? It doesn't feel great, and it goes against every fiber of our being, but God sometimes uses discomfort to keep us awake because he knows nothing else will. <laughs> we got to fight to stay woke because we crave comfort and ease. But what's the second thing that we learn? 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 7, still the NLT. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. He's talking to Christians now. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. <laughs> Here's the second thing we learn. True followers of Christ believe in staying woke. Repeat after me. Being woke is not a fad. It's a Christian reality. Who says amen to that today? <laughs> Paul says that the believers in Jesus will not be surprised when Jesus comes again, even though he comes as a thief. Why is that? Because they are alert and clear-headed. And he says that the reason why is because they are children of light and of the day. Another way of putting that is being woke is a function of being a child of light. Those who belong to darkness don't believe in staying awake, but embrace sleep. They are never on their guard. They don't care to be because it's not a function of being a child of darkness. They love being in the dark and they welcome it with open arms. 
They don't like being in discomfort. They don't like being on their guard. They don't like looking out. They don't like being awake. Any of that stuff. They love the night because that's when you sleep and get drunk, according to Paul. <laughs> and who needs to be clear-headed when you're not watching out for anything? It's not necessary. Being awake and alert is a function of being a true follower of Christ. It's supposed to be one of the core values that we have. It's what makes us who we are, according to Paul. A core value, what is that? Core value is a fundamental belief or a guiding principle that dictates your behavior. A core value does more than just tell you right from wrong. A core value helps you to determine whether or not you're on the right path to fulfilling your goals in life. And Paul is saying that if we are true believers in Christ, Christ, that we will be awake and that will be a core value of ours. Just natural to being a follower of Jesus Christ. When my brother and I were kids, we would sometimes stay up late and wait for our dad to come home. And of course, we weren't supposed to be awake. We we're supposed to be in bed. <laughs> but there was something that felt wrong about going to sleep before dad got home. You, you know, any sons out there know what I'm talking about? <laughs> now, we might have had a late night. He might have had a late night at board meeting or maybe he was coming back from an out of town trip. Whatever the case was, it was natural for us. What did I say? Natural. That's right. It was natural for us to stay up late and wait for dad to get home. I remember hearing the way the key sounded when it went into the door and he jiggled it open and then we would run from the back of the house and jump in his arms and yell, Daddy, you're home. We were so excited that he was back. We didn't even care that we had school early the next morning because all young boys know about staying up late until their dad gets home. It's what it means to be a son. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, right? Just like it's natural for an eight-year-old boy to wait up for his dad to come home, it's just as natural for a true believer to stay woke for Jesus and his coming. Who says amen to that today? <laughs> it's not something you have to conjure up or manufacture. You can't fake it. It's just part of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. All true followers of Christ believe in staying woke. Our last point. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 through 11. The Bible says, But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Who says amen to God's word today? Here's our last point. Staying woke makes us confident in our salvation. Repeat after me. I will be saved by the grace of God. You believe that? Notice that Paul says that if we remain clear headed and woke, we will be protected by spiritual armor. Now, the first two pieces of armor are faith and love, and we're familiar with those. Faith is that thing that ignites our relationship with Jesus, because as Hebrews 11 teaches, it's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's as vital to our spiritual walk as breathing. <laughs> Love, of course, is the essence of God himself because as the Bible declares in 1 John 4, God is love. So we know these twin principles are of the utmost importance in our spiritual walk, but there's something about the way that the helmet is characterized in this verse that interests me. You know about the armor of God that's listed in Ephesians chapter 6, right? There's this whole list. Paul says, put on the armor of God, and he has all these different things. Well, in that list, we find there's a helmet in Ephesians 6. It's called the helmet of salvation. But here, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul calls the helmet the, the confidence of our salvation. Now, I find that word confidence intriguing because of our orientation to having confidence in things related to our Christian walk. Growing up in, in the church, uh, we were implicitly taught, and we still kind of teach people that if they're confident in their salvation, they are arrogant. That if you want to be perceived as spiritual, you must not display confidence in that area. But this teaching that we just read 
this teaching that we just that I just said actually disregards a key aspect of being woke. Christian wokeness is at its core about keeping a connection with Jesus. It's remaining awake, alert, and connected to Christ that keeps us safe in the end and gives us confidence in our salvation. If your confidence is in yourself, then you should feel bad about that. It's arrogant for us to think that we can ever stand up against the wiles of the devils on our own. But that's what the armor of God is for. And it turns out that if we are connected to Christ, we have nothing to fear because Jesus keeps us safe with his armor of love that is activated by our faith so that we can have confidence in our salvation through him. Glory to his matchless name. Paul says he's not trying to destroy us anyway. Jesus wants to save us. We must stay woke so that we can be confident in our salvation. Wow. Who says amen to that today? <laughs> so that's it. Those are the three things. We fight to stay woke because we crave comfort and ease. True followers of Christ believe in staying woke. And thirdly, staying woke makes us confident in our salvation. You believe the word of God today? The devil called his imps together to come up with some new plans on how to trick humans into being lost in the end. And the first of his demons stepped forward and said, I have an idea. I think we should tell them that there is no God. The devil replied, that will never work. Even if you tell them there is no God, they won't believe you. There's plenty of evidence all around that God exists. They'll know in their heart of hearts, even if they deny him with their words. That'll never work. Who's next? <laughs> the next imp came forward and said, I'll tell them that there's no hell. No way, the devil says. That will never work either. People know intuitively that there's eventually going to be some punishment for sin and that their wicked deeds will need to be punished. So that won't work. No way in the world. Get out of here. Who's next? A third demon stepped up and he had the best idea yet. Here's what he said. I'll tell them that there's no hurry. Take your time. Just live your life. You'll have time to make things right in the end. The devil said, that's perfect. Now all of you go out and spread that there's no hurry. Friends of mine, that's a lie from the devil that you can just go to sleep and you'll be fine. It's just not true. What is true is that if you stay awake and alert and connected to Jesus, that you can be sure of your salvation in him. His coming is soon, and he wants you to be in the number of those who are saved. Won't you choose him today? It's amazing when I hear that story and I think about the way that I grew up and the way that I lived. I lived my life like there was no hurry, like it didn't matter, like I could take my time, like I had all the time in the world to give my life to Jesus. But the reality is that all that time that I believed that, the devil was trying to take me out and he was hoping that he could take my life so that I would not be saved in the end. But I'm so glad for the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that kept me through to this day. And because of that, I can be confident that I'll be saved in the number when Jesus comes the second time. Do you believe God's word today? Do you want to be saved in the end? If you want 2021 to be the best year that you've ever had with Jesus, raise your hand right now. If you know that you cannot accomplish that on your own, raise your other hand right now. Now look up and say, I surrender. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's somebody out there today who recognizes that now is the best opportunity for them to make a decision for Jesus. In fact, you've just realized that this is the first Sabbath of the new year. And now you have a chance to actually say, I want to be in the family of God. So I don't know who you are, but you're watching right now. Now is your time. All you have to do is either follow the link that's on the screen right now, or you can type, give me Jesus in the chat and someone from our team will contact you. We'll get the ball rolling and you can be included in one of our upcoming baptisms. In fact, we got a baptism next Sabbath, January 9th. 
We'd love to include you in that. If you think that's too soon, we'll schedule another baptism for you right after that. No problem with us. In fact, Pastor Anwar always likes to say, the only reason why we're here is to fill that baptismal pool and to put people in it. <laughs> so everything revolves around that. We'll fill the pool every week until you're ready. Who are you? Maybe, maybe you've already been baptized and all you want to do is come back to Jesus. You can still type, give me Jesus. Maybe you're someone who wants to join this Sabbath keeping family. You want to be part of Tacoma Park Online. If that's you, put it in the chat. We'll make something happen with you today. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't assume you have all the time in the world. That's a lie from the devil. Jesus is coming soon. And he wants you to be included in that number. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the encouraging word that we have heard today on this first Sabbath of the new year. There was so much despair, so much negativity in 2020, but we left all that behind. And now here we are looking forward to the wonderful things you have in store for us in 2021. Lord, we want a relationship with you that is ironclad, that is rock solid, that will never give up. The kind of relationship you have with us already. We want that kind of relationship with you. So, Father, give that to us beginning today. Bless that person who put Give Me Jesus into the chat. Bless that man, woman, boy, or girl. They've made the most important decisions of their lives. Thank you for that, oh God. Help them to be able to walk with you from this day forward, never going back to their old way of sin. And may they be saved into your kingdom when you come. And then, Lord, may 2021 be the year that Jesus Christ returns. That would be wonderful. And we could spend eternity with you, never having to part again. Bring that day soon. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone who loves God say together, amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm so glad you joined us today. And I hope you'll come back again on next Sabbath at 1130. Same time, same channel. We'll have our big baptism next week. We're excited about it. And we have other things planned for your edification. And you know what? All of this stuff that we do is not possible were it not for the generosity of people like you. So if you want a chance today to be able to give to and donate and to support the ministry here at Tacoma Park, all you have to do is go to www.thetpchurch.org slash give. And when you go to our website, you'll see all the different ways in which you can uh, support the ministry here that's at Tacoma Park. God bless you. We hope to see you next Sabbath. I believe we're having children's church today at one o'clock. So if you want to email Pastor Job for the Zoom information, uh, she can get that to you. Grizel Zelda.job at thetpchurch.org. That begins at one o'clock today, and we know that God is going to be with you. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Enjoy the rest.